Okay, so we're moving on to the second half of the program, which is our last talk as well as the open spaces. So for our, our last talk of the conference, I'm going to introduce a guy named Bill Manning. He is, works at JFrog. I have no idea what he's gonna talk about, so he tells me it's gonna be good. So if it's not, blame him. Anyway, Bill Manning, everyone. Hey guys. Can you guys hear me? There we go. Hey, clap once if you can hear me. No. Um, so I, <laughs> how are you doing? I'm Bill Manning. Uh, I work for JFrog, uh, of course. Uh, we're going to be talking today about DevOps theory and practice. So the biggest thing about this, we call it, of course, the lovely song of ice and tire fires. Now, I'm not going to be doing this all by myself up here because I'm boring. Um, yes, I am this tall, and it does, you know, so don't adjust your glasses or anything like that. But we have a special guest here with me tonight. And if you could actually get your hands together, give him a big round of applause for Baruch. Come on. So, Baruch, have a seat. So basically what we're going to talk about today is let me do a little talk about who Baruch is. Who is this guy sitting up here with this magical hat and this very atypical uh, Silicon Valley leader jacket? Um, so we have here is Baruch. Now Baruch goes around the world. He talks to many folks and different people about what it takes to be in DevOps. He works at many different companies. Yes, this does seem unfathomable, but we have a very complex algorithm that actually schedules him uh, correctly. And yes, obviously, he is better than everyone in this room. <laughs> and my job here is I'm Bill Manning, and I'm as official translator. Um, we're going to have him talk in a few minutes, but the whole thing is, is my job is to help take his vast, broad thoughts and turn them into something that's digestible, like that lovely lunch you had. And I'm glad you guys are all here, because the thing is, I'm sure you're all going to be nice and sleepy, and I'm, hopefully I can wake you up. So these are the things I'm, you know, English and bad English, absolutely. I also, I'm very, very fluent in uh, thought leader gibberish. And Baruch here is our thought leader today. So if you have any questions or problems with the translation, blame me. Let's get going. Baruch, okay. please, take it away. I am ready. So let's start with, everybody's software must be releasable at absolutely any time. It's extremely important that every genius idea you have will be coded and if immediately available to your customers and clients. What that means is at 2 a.m., suddenly you come up with this amazing idea. It's going to affect the lives of 10 million users that you have. You should absolutely sit down, code it, get it out there, push it out to public. Who needs like surveys, tests, or questionnaires or anything? Just let them have it. Everyone must have 100% test automation. And extremely important to cover everything with 100% tests and make it completely automated. You have that one feature in your product out there that maybe one person in a billion uses. Make sure that you spend enough time building test procedures around that. Usually three to four months is applicable. Take that, make sure you run with it, run it all the time, you know, go from there. Continuous security becomes a part of our pipeline as continuous integration, as continuous delivery. It's important to embed it into the process. We have over 150,000 global engineers. Six of them actually work in security. So we want to make sure that we have the highest reliability standards on the market. And the thing is, is that when a third party comes to us and lets us know that there's something wrong, we basically politely ignore them, usher them out of the building, hopefully you never see them again. People are great. Your greatest threat is never an employee, but an outage. Baruch here is our resident techno nomad. No cubicle, no walls, nothing can hold him back. He is global, he is out there. And he also carries $80 billion worth of credit card information on his laptop. I don't see any problem with that, do you? Virtual machines are horrible. You can never build a successful DevOps culture and process via virtualization. This is where we must focus our innovation. We spent $25 billion restructuring over the past 10 years. We're going to throw it all away, and we're going to virtualization. Kubernetes and Docker is the future. So we want to make sure that we're ahead of the curve on this one. We want to move forward as fast as we possibly can. No more VMs. <laughs> yeah, no more VMs. You are a beautiful, unique snowflake as your problem. No vendor ever could possibly understand them. You have to develop all the solutions in-house. 
We make widgets, and widgets are king. Everybody here has a widget. I know you guys do. And the thing is, is that why would we trust some third-party company to understand our business needs? We decide to build everything internally ourselves because it's maintainable, easy to fix, easy to maintain. Oh, by the way, and when something does go wrong, we actually like to go outside, scream at the sky, find the first person we, you know, we could possibly find, and once again, usher yep. them out of the building. Our company is based in San Francisco because that's where the best talent is. We decided to take our funding and set up shop in the most landlocked area with the highest prices in the country. Also, the place where every single major, basically besides New York, uh, disaster film takes place. What could possibly go wrong? And that's all for us. Thank Thanks, you very guys. much. <laughs>
why don't we do the same thing? So they went through. And the no, thing that, is... Bill, that makes a lot of sense, right? It, because there is obviously a casualty here. Airfields and planes bring supplies. Magic stuff from the sky. If we build airfields and planes, we will get supplies. Absolutely. Well, there's a problem with that. It never happened. <laughs> Why was that? They were missing some central things. And this is known by Cargo Cult. We're going to talk about Cargo Cult a lot today. And the thing that they miss is actually context, right? So um, we believe that this lack of context is exactly why you go to a conference and hear about uh, cows monkeys from Netflix and then come to your boss and say, you know what, let's implement cows monkey in the North production environment of ATMs because what can possibly go wrong? It, just, it justifies the cost of the, sh the plane ticket, the flight, and the swag. And <laughs> this is the lack of context. This is the thing. So how do we get this context? There are a couple of options, and first of all would be analysts. Analysts are everywhere. Their job is to evaluate, quantitate, and qualify technologies, process, whether you're doing technology all the way up to even making socks or anything else. Right. Their job is to evaluate markets and strategies. Guys like Forrester and Gardner and IHS McKee and IDC and keep, keep, going. keep going, obviously. There are like tens of them, but those are the, the, the leaders. And they provide us with help and guidance on the context. Correct. So let's take a look here. This is the uh, typical Forrester, um, you know, the Forrester graph right here. So if you take Forrester a look. Wave. Oh, thank you. I, I, I don't want to get sued. Um, so what we have here is, you know, they, they set up the, you know, the vectors down here. You have, you know, up and to the right being good and down to the bottom being weak, which sounds really funny. You know, like it's a weak technology. Um, the thing is also, too, they didn't want to be sued um, by a company like Gartner, who had their, you know, they decided to make their own, the wave so versus the graph. Yeah, so Forrester wave is the closest thing to Gartner magic quadrant that you can pull off without being sued. Correct. <laughs> And then the whole point behind it is the same kind of justification. You have up and to the right, which are the thought leaders, like Baruch here that we brought in earlier, because his knowledge is base, and the product lines that which he represents are up and to the right. Those are the niche players. And no, oh, that's the bottom. No, so, the bottom, the bottom left. Bottom left, players. or as we like to call them, shitty. And the thing <laughs> is, and, and, yeah. And in this case, the thing is, is that, you know, they have their qualifiers, they have like what, you know, justifies them as a company. Don't get me wrong, but you want to aspire up and to the right. And that's where these companies want to go. And when you bring a bright, shiny object that's up and to the right, you might get a little bit more notice on it. And another example of this context that the analysts provide us is uh, what is called the hype cycle. And uh, this is um, a putting a technology on this, um, I would say, kind of a default cycle of technology hype. When it starts with, uh, you know, with expectations that go up, and then there is a peak of inflated expectations, and then it collapses into a throat of disillusionment, and then it kind of go up into enlightenment and, and end up in productivity. And obviously, there every technology, according to Gartner, is living through this, uh, this hype. And I'm all excited to actually use the pew pew laser button on this to point out that I'm still waiting for my broadband over power line technology to uh, at my house. I, that investment I did 10 years ago really paid off. According to Gardner, it was obsolete before it reached the plateau, so no, yeah. no <laughs> broadband over power lines. And now for you tell you. me. Yep. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, so the problem with analysts is they are pay to play, right? And, and I think I. I didn't discover anything new here for you. Um, it's, uh, it's a well-known fact that if you want to uh, get into those radars, into those uh, quadrants and waves, you actually need to become a customer of those analysts, and that's for the reason so they can investigate you better, but also you need to pay tons of money for them to do that. So that's they, kind of weird, yeah. but there are good alternatives. ThoughtWorks. Here's one up here. I mean, this is a free resource. It comes out, you know, once a quarter about. Yep. And it gives a fair assessment of the technology base, right? We're not promoting them right now. We're just saying there's tools out there. Be aware of it. You know, the thing is, is why spend a huge amount of money on those analysts when you could do something like ThoughtWorks or, or many other groups or get fair assessments from people out there who have actually implemented the pain, the suffering, the ROI, whatever. 
great, great, pro, a great advantage of technology radar is that when you dive into one of those areas, you get this picture of what to adapt or what to try or what to work with or what to not work with. They are actually all clickable. And you can get the context of why it was put of where it was put, right? So for example, circle CI now is on the rise across the board. You saw them on the top right in the magic quadrant. They're here as, as, as trial, big friends of JFrog, very nice guys. But that's not enough of a reason, right? Instead, you can click here on circle CI and get an explanation why they are where they are. Right, and it's not just an assessment of how they are, where they are, and why they are, but also too, any of the key factors too, pros, cons, you know, things like that, and there's those links to that information. You know, real world objectives and real world technologies, once they're implemented, have, you know, not, not everything fits for every company. Even our company at JFrog, you know, the thing is, is we always get people always ask us, you know, how, how would I implement this? And we'll give suggestions, we'll give context behind it on how best practices are, what are the good things to do, how to best assess your organization to make sure that it's even right for you. But the thing is, is that every organization is different. And you know, that's always something to keep in mind. And we're going to talk about that uh, uh, right now. So <laughs> the, uh, we have all those analysts and researchers kind of draft the landscape for you. You know who is doing well, you know who uh, they are suggest to adopt, but you don't want to build planes out of, hey, you need to really know where you are standing and whether adopting a certain technology is right for you. And self-management can be done, one of, the, one of the things is through maturity models. So what, what are maturity models? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually, so we have Martin Fowler, who's actually a respected name in the community. Um, you can take your time to read this right now, but of course, you never want to read slides, of course. But we can always do this. I'm going to let Baruch explain it. We're going to concentrate yeah, and on and one and part. I will, I will give you two sentences out of it. First, the maturity model is a tool that helps people or groups assess the current effectiveness and support it with facts. Maturity models have a bad name sometimes, but if done right, they are essential to understand this context and prevent the fire tire, the tire fire that we showed you in the beginning. Absolutely. So there's always the assessment, and we're going to go through some of those kind of explanations behind this. But remember, you know, there's always this entire thing: is you're an organization, you're a symbiotic entity that depends on each other, works together, all the way from the salesperson all the way down to the guy who sits there and just deploys things, right. or even if you automate it, which you should. Yep. <laughs> all right, so there are obviously components into maturity models. Let's go briefly about them. So first of all, evaluation factors. We need to understand what we, uh, what we want to evaluate, what we actually measure. What are the key quantitators that you're going to utilize for this model to make sure that your results is not a wasted effort, that you actually have something you want to achieve and work towards? Scoring methodology is another way. How do you honestly score certain things in your organization? Is it time, effort, is it money, is it end result? You know, understanding those scope and those efforts can really help you, you know, streamline your organization and also address any sort of issues you might what have. What good looks like and what bad looks like, Correct. right? Self-assessment and a third-party assessment capability. Uh, so 80% of the drivers think they're better than average. Uh, well. That's, in, in some cases, that could be the case, but that's when you bring a third-party assessor in and gives you the cold, wet blanket that makes sure that you understand that you're not a pretty, so you're either a unique snowflake, that your organization does have warts and all, but the thing is, though, they can be addressable. And both of those assessments are important. Uh, progress tracking, obviously, we need to measure our progress over time. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? That's as important as just taking a snapshot in one period of time. And then visualization. How do you visualize this? I mean, I, used to, I like to use the primary color method. Baruch, what is your assessment of good and bad things? Uh, we're going to talk about it later, but for now, just remember what we're going to show you now is a very complicated and very expensive tool. The majority of you won't ever get it. Some percentage will pay a lot of money to understand how to work with it, and maybe eventually you will succeed. And this tool is, where is my tool? Maturity model examples. Where is my tool? Yep. Here you go. Oh, I don't know. Show it. I, oh, 
What? Yeah, just click through it. I'm Here trying. you go. Microsoft yes. Excel. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> it's amazing you don't need anything. No, oh. I think I need to do an assessment of the tool. Um, so Yeah, no. The, the, all the examples that we are going to show you are done in Microsoft Excel. And uh, the, the tool is really not, not the important part. Um, so here's an example of a simple maturity model. Uh, so, so, uh, and, and you can see here that we have those axes of tools and processes. And we want to advance on both of them and go to the right top corner. So there we go, up and to the right. Remember, up and to the right, good. So when we assess a company, one of the things is that when they put together their self-assessment, they picture to themselves here. They know they need some improvement. Obviously, they brought some people in. They're actually sitting around having the discussion. So they know something's wrong. They know that it can be better. Every organization can always be better. Well, suddenly the third party people came in and said, no, actually, you're down here. So you know, you're not as high and mighty as you think you are. Sorry, you need much more improvement. Now, those external people doesn't have to be Gardner and Forrester and analysts that you pay fortune for. It could be your peers from other teams. It could be your colleagues. It needs to be someone from the outside that do the assessment. And this gap between self-assessment and third-party assessment, it's a very interesting conversation by its own. It's not just, OK, we were wrong, you're in a different place, let's start from there. It's actually imp important and interesting to understand how this gap was created. So when we go to start off with this, let's start off with today. So now that you actually have the fair assessment done by a third party, here's the starting point of where your organization is. And now you need to plan forward. So you need to plan where you want to be in a short to medium term like. Uh, where, where you go, want, want to go next, but it's also very important to keep an eye uh, to keep an eye on the big price, and that's where you want to be eventually. So eventually, you also, by the way, so keep this in mind. You always hear the terminology. You know, the thing is, is it's a marathon. It's not a race kind of thing. Well, it is, right? So in other words, you make sure you put your, you know, your shoes on, you know, left foot on your left foot and right foot on your right foot and, you know, lace them up and ready to go. But you have a target. You've got a place you want to go. And how do you start, you know, evaluating what you have to where you aspire to be? Now, if you notice here, one of the important parts is we made sure we didn't go all the way up and too far to the right. We're going to talk about that. Yep. Yep. Oh. Oops. Oh. There yeah. <laughs> so um, healthy, a little bit of uh, healthy competition is always good, and uh, we want to incentivize teams by looking at other teams and want to go after them. Oh, we're gonna have a cage match. This is the cage oh, match. Okay. Yes. So we're gonna have a cage match between teams. It's okay. It's fair. No eye gouging. No fish hooking. Right? This we're is good? how you do okay. it. Yes. Right. Uh, so um, I'm trying. <laughs> uh, that's, that's an example of kind of dipping down. So you saw the dots, and again, you need more context. And that's an example of how you assess and evaluate on those two assesses. So we'll start with tools. So first category, on-demand releases. And then, like, we're talking about tools this time, not the process. And the big goal is builds are configured and published to consume artifacts from artifact management system in a consumable format. It so might sound a little bit vague, Right, and that's from a project manager. So the project manager says to me that, and I go, oh my god, what am I going to do? So well, what are we going to have to do? We have to break that down and assess where we are, where we want to go, and where, you know, how things right. are. So this goal of reproducible builds brings uh, down to you need to cache and proxy your third party dependencies. And you need to manage to your artifacts. And you need to take them through uh, life cycles and quality barriers. And you need build information to be uh, uh, embedded with the artifacts. And this build information need to be searched and queried and visible. I think I know a tool just like that. I mean, there's a company like that. I mean, I mean shameless plug, JFrog Artifactory. JFrog Artifactory. Yeah, like, yeah, boss, you saw that? We're good? All right, yeah, good. All right. Now our, we can our continue boss is with watching. the real. Now we can continue with the real stuff. And, and you, see, you see how, uh, that's another example, that's the process axis, right? So the same on-demand releases. Now we're talking about process. And the process, the goal is exactly the same, but now let's see what process supports it, right? So here we have a list of what needs to be done in the process. And take a look at the last column here. Yes, partial, yes, yes. We're going to talk about how we decide on what yes is. When can we declare that we actually have this thing done? Colorful well. approach, something that I personally like a lot, is also very good. We spoke about the importance of uh, visualization. So we can see here the same 
breakdown of the same items right here on the on the, on your uh, left side and then criticality we are going to talk about defining criticality and three different states now we're going to apologize if you are colorblind which is actually a possibility yes those are colorful so we have things here as you know we start looking at a benchmark now I talked about how you know the thing is is moving in progress and not going to 100%. It makes something achievable. Make it so that your organization doesn't get deterred if it doesn't get to that 100% status because nobody is. So having that kind of benchmark to work towards what is your nirvana, where is that you know high upon the mountain where you want to go to make it part of your organization is there. Then of course there's the red. Yeah. So the this is, is where the things are horrible and everything is look like shit. That's where we stand today, right? Absolutely. And having that, though, at the same time, that's a fair assessment. I would be really surprised if I actually did see a team out there that gave itself an honest assessment like that. But the thing is, is that where do you want to be 24 months from now? Now, here's the thing. Here's a big change. If you take a look at the way these numbers are on the side, yes, this is where they want to be. But there are some, there are some other considerations to take into account when coming up with this metrics of information. So let's look, for example, at number 16, the Fed drum elements. Obviously, our company, it is important to our company to get there, and this is benchmarking 100%. We didn't touch this thing, it's zero now. And although, in theory, it's very important to our company, we won't get to it up until next benchmark. So it's still zero when we'll measure it next time, and that's okay. Yeah, and having that kind of fair assessment is good. You know, recognizing for your corporation what's most important might actually come from the least likely places. And having that information and having that ability to achieve towards that is really kind of the things we're talking about. And that's what we're going to do next. Now, we need to define our factors and, and what is really important. And you can see here that there are some greens, which is highly important, and some yellows, which are not very important. And yeah, uh, those are defined by different teams. Now, here's the thing is, is that when you look at something like here, now we have some you know, basic information like from an engineering perspective, you know, from an ops perspective, and from a company perspective. You know, the thing is, like I talked about, you know, organizations are symbiotic. You know, one can't live without the other. If the sales team or the customers aren't coming to your site or whatever you're doing, you're not going to be able to pay the, you know, the engineers, right? So everybody understands this. It's basic, you know, economics. Now, the thing is, though, is having that fair technology assessment about what is applicable to the company and what is not comes down to things like here. Let's use this as an example. Continuous delivery of product feature. And you look like developers, they say, like, we don't care about that. That's, we, it's after we're done with our code. And you obviously at DevOps days, so you know what the problem with this assessment. But even more interesting, the company perspective, and this is where we come to our sales guys and our management, and they're like, well, it's probably nice to have continuous delivery, but uh, we don't really care. All we want is features. Well, suddenly, that same team that says all we want is features, well, how do you get those features faster to the market to increase the revenue of the company, thus proving to them that this was actually a must-have feature because the thing is is that your competitors, are maybe they're striking first, but you'll be able to get it out there faster. Well, that's where you know, having, and, and that, having that role play and understanding the quality of what comes from your, you know, what you produce to what it actually produces as an ROI is actually super essential and important. Difficult discussions to have, takes time, but at the same time, putting in that commitment as an organization to change things really can help. And, and you, all, I, I hope the majority of you read the Phonics Project, which is obviously the example of how continuous delivery becomes important to the business and how this assessment of, it's nice to have, but it's not really what we care about, is absolutely wrong. So once again, this is just part of that discussion. We're going to kind of skip over. We're running low on time here. But the whole idea is to actually define what those objectives are in a quantitative state that everybody in the company understands so that when they voice their words and their opinions, it matters and it fits the company paradigm. So again, this is what good looks like and what bad looks like and what partial looks like. And we want to end up with a, just a bunch of do's and don'ts of what to do and what not to do. And, uh, well, primary colors. Crayons are good. Very Baruch important. loves crayons. If oh, I yes, Baruch... because I know that green is good and red is bad, and good. this is very important. 
Good job. <laughs> so then the thing is, other things you want to do is involve the teams, right? Involve your company. Get them together. Have that discussion. Put people in rooms that they're not usually sitting in rooms with and go from there. And that goes back to this, well, continuous delivery, it's not very important. Bring the people that will explain that it is, and this is how you define your model correctly. This is why we put magic beans in the product. Yes. Uh, Self-assessment and third-party assessment, we spoke about how important it is. It's nice exercise to let the teams assess themselves first and then kind of contrast it with the harsh reality and talk about the gap. Also, too, the thing is, is that when you start evaluating this, look at the teams that are really trying to push this forward, that has the need, the desire, the ability to do this. Use it as your, pre your testing and proving ground. You know, make sure you have the people who, are, who want to achieve and strive towards this. And that can include you know, everything. Make that SWAT team. Make that you know, assessment team to make sure the success of the project and what you're doing. 100% uh, goal is not, usually not a good idea. Um, it's, um, it's not a good idea because it discourages people and also because people invest in the, those last percentage uh, amount of effort that definitely is not justified. It's better to reward the teams than to have them walk away disheartened. Yep. And also too, the thing is, is this is not a one-time gig. Having that assessment done, maybe you know, and you know, quarterly is probably best. Maybe whatever you determine for your company, what works. Once again, what works for your company? But go back, assess it, make improvements, make the strides, move forward. Don't look back, but take that knowledge and put it together. The model should change by itself. You remember, VMs are out, Docker and Kubernetes is in. When you have these tools definition on where to have to be, this should reflect this change in the tools itself because incentives are important. If your model say, we need to strive to virtualization, that's what people will do, even if that's not what your company needs anymore. You need to keep an eye on your model and involve it as well. And the most important thing is you have levels. Can we go to level six? If we are on level two. How about level five? Do not go to level six. Yeah, but Instead, go to level three. How about level six? And then if you're good enough, you will go to level four. And then, sorry, Bill, there is no level six. Once again, I was let down. Yep. <laughs> so this is it. That's what, um, that's our message to you. And um, I'm J. Baruch on Twitter. This I'm is William Manning, William Manning on Twitter. Um, Jeffrey.com slash show notes. The slides are there. The video will be there by tomorrow. All the links are there. The writing, the comments, the raffle. Thank you very much. Pew, pew. We won't <laughs> have time for questions on the stage, no. but we will be here around and we have a guidance for how to ask questions. So, um, things that are not questions. Your resume <laughs> is not a question. <laughs> Calling bullshit on the entire premise of the talk. We just put this together. So if you want to call bullshit, that's fine. I won't listen. <laughs> and you need to be actually talking about something specific. Long rambling story with no point, even if with question mark in the end, is still not a question. But if you come up to us, you can consolidate these all together with, this is how we do things at Google. This oh. is, yeah. you ruined it, yeah, but that's yeah. okay. I ruined it. All right, we're right. Oh. Thank you very much. We went over. And with that, catch us here. <laughs>